Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual roundtable, which is a space for senior housing officers. Um, and we are uh, delighted to have the Akuai Rancher and Default 2021 Workgroup members here with us today. Um, you can see kind of the representation of that group here. Here are the folks that are with us from that group, um, and they're very excited to be speaking with you all today on all the important topics facing reentry into fall. Um, before we jump into the program, a couple pieces of housekeeping items that we wanted to quickly go over. Um, the first is, and if you've been on these before, you know this already, uh, but this is conversation-based, so please feel ready and willing and able to participate. Um, you'll have the opportunity to connect and be part of the roundtable. The other piece is that we hope that you will submit questions and comments. You can do this by using the chat button, which is on your Zoom menu. Hopefully you see that at the bottom of your screen probably. Um, when you enter those questions, and you can do that throughout the program, um, please enter your name, your institution, and whatever you want to ask or make a comment on. With that, I'm gonna pass it to Dan Pedersen, our chair and our moderator. Dan. Thank you, Holly. Good uh, afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have one hour to cover a lot of information, so we're going to be pretty snappy with this today. So I'm going to ask the members of the panel that are also leaders of the subgroups within our work group to introduce themselves and let you know where their um, content expertise is regarding our work on the reentry plan. So we'll start with Dr. Vicka Bell. Hi, everyone. My name is Vicka Bell Robinson. I'm the Director of Residence Life at Miami University. And on this work group, I'm looking to my work, my subgroup is specifically looking at how would we advocate for um, the care uh, of our students. Um, sometimes we can get sort of lost in the, the testing and the tracing and the all of that and like lose, lose sense of our actual human beings that we're working with. So my um, subgroup is really working, looking at that kind of stuff. Ricky. Um, yes, first of all, I don't claim any expertise in, in anything, but my assignment area is uh, student compliance. And so our subgroup is looking at, uh, based on the various uh, requirements that many institutions will have regarding masking, vaccination, visitation, guest policies, and other things that other groups are looking at, how do we hold them accountable for that? Do we utilize our conduct system for that? Do we encourage uh, incentive or positive or social norming aspects to try to do that? When is it a student conduct issue? When is it a student code issue? Um, and then also try to make sure that how do we begin to encourage their compliance with ongoing public safety guidelines, not necessarily just our policies, but general health and safety practices. Some of the questions we're concerned about uh, are particularly looking at uh, group gathering sizes and, and risky behavior, uh, even when potentially a high percentage of the population has been uh, vaccinated. That's it for now. Um, Thanks, Frankie. Gay, would you like to go next? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Gay Perez and I'm at the University of Virginia and I have the thrill of leading the vaccination uh, subgroup and uh, it is it's it's I like to coin it after one of my favorite movie franchise Fast and Furious because when we got involved in this topic probably four weeks ago things that we were talking about then and now is completely fast forwarded. So I look forward to hearing your ideas and things that keep you up at night. Okay. There are many, that's a, that's a pretty long list for me. Christina, would you like to go next? Sure, my name is Christina Lowry. I'm the Director of Residential Life and Housing here at the University of Southern Maine. My content area is student engagement and transitions post pandemic. So looking at as our students come back on campus, how we're gonna support them, what experiences they're coming back with and where they're gonna need that additional uh, programmatic support from us. Um, our committee has started with some work looking at how we can even start doing that this summer um, and hope to get you some information soon. Thank you. Steven, would you like to introduce yourself? Happy to, this is Steven Appenow. I am the Director of Housing Services at Bucknell University. And my area of focus is operations and processes. So think of uh, move in, uh, room changes, and maybe um, some collaboration with other offices such as dining services and all of the processes that go in with all of those intricacies and what we're going to do. Great, thank you all very much. So, and also I wanna thank the participants for preloading questions when you registered for the event today. Um, we were able to go through your questions and we found five fairly significant themes that we'd like to start off our conversations focusing on. Um, as you might guess, vaccinations was one of the more popular areas that folks are looking for guidance on. 
So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're seeing regarding requirements for students, requirements for your staff, incentives campuses may be considering for getting folks vaccinated, um, what your plans are for recording vaccination records, and then also there seem to be some concerns about how to manage roommate um, expectations for campuses that may not mandate vaccination. So we'll let Gay start off by talking a little bit about what their subgroup has been uncovering regarding all of this. Sure, thank you, Dan. Um, I believe, you know, if we uh, take a little step back, um, there were some schools when vaccinations started rolling out, there were early adopters of mandating vaccines. And then people were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And at the beginning, it was more um, falling along the lines of public private. Um, and then fast forward a few weeks. And now what we're seeing is, um, it's switched from public private to whether your institution is going to mandate the vaccine or whether it's not going to mandate the vaccine. So one of the things that our sub, uh, subgroup has been working diligently on and in partnership with ACHA is the guidance from the CDC, uh, the ACHA's advocacy and what they what they're doing um, on behalf of institutions of higher education. Um, the questions that you all have talked about, um, if you are in a position at your school to actually even have or be part of the conversation about whether you're going to mandate or not mandate, housing, uh, senior housing officers tend to be in the position of, okay, I'm going to wait to see where, where my institution is, and then all of a sudden, the responsibility then shifts to you as to how, how we're going to manage it. And I think what we are advocating and what we're gonna recommend um, moving forward is listening to all the questions that are coming in, trying to take the guidance that's being um, rolled out and changed and conversations at individual institutions about what their hot buttons are. So for instance, at Virginia just last week, we have mandated um, the vaccine for all of our students new and returning. We were very fortunate in the spring when we rolled out our vaccination policy, um, over 12,000 of our students out of 23,000 have already been fully vaccinated prior to leaving Charlottesville for the spring. So we have a system in place with our student health, which is called the Healthy Who's Portal where students, regardless of where they get their vaccines, will upload their proof of vaccinations and they have a deadline of July 1st. So we are rolling that out. But one of the things that um, went into our favor in the, the state of Virginia is, is that our attorney general made a ruling on um, whether we were able to uh, mandate vaccines. And uh, so we got the green light from the state. And so a lot of the institutions are now trying to just kind of figure it out. One of the caveats is, is that we are also in the process of determining an exemption process for religious, medical, and then our international students, a temporary waiver where if they cannot get their vaccine in their home country prior to coming here, they can request a waiver, but it says that once you're here, you have to upload your proof by October 1st. So now then we're gonna get into incentives, um, but that's why I'll just give you, that's kind of what we've been working on right now. Thank you, Gay. Are there any follow-up questions from participants for Gay and the subgroup work? Oh, I'm sure you want to know something. Well, Gay, I guess one of the questions that we, we discussed for a while is either the standard medical and uh, religious exemptions, but whether there should be a third category or not. I think our institution right now, following the advice, is looking at only those two institutions, but then determining uh, what fits within those categories at, at this point. 
Um, so again, we've just recently adopted a vaccine requirement for all students that does not include faculty and staff at some, uh, at some point. Uh, so I imagine that would become a conversation. Uh, but I did discover that Rhode Island is the most union, uh, unionized state in the entire uh, country. So uh, the collective bargaining units have a big uh, impact on what we can and can't require. I would draw your attention though to uh, the ACHA report that we've done to uh, very early and that when it talks about uh, residents, there's a section on housing and dining that it strongly encourages that all res live in residential staff and all staff working in residence halls be vaccinated uh, at that point for their own safety and for the safety of the community. So that's, that's in the ACHA guidelines. Okay, I guess I have a question about um, how you are, whether, whether you're, you're your subgroup or on your campus, how you're navigating and negotiating um, students who cannot um, get vaccinated or who are, are, are concerned with the safety of the vaccination because it's under, still under temporary measures. Um, I'm just wondering how you're doing that. And also if, if you have any advice for schools who might have a, a, a residency requirement and how do you navigate the, the re requirement to live on campus um, and with the requirement to have um, this sort of what, what I would call experimental vaccination um, compared to all the other vaccinations we may or may not require on our campuses. Yeah, the, we're, what we're talking about is um, with ACHA is that the responsibility of those questions about the residency requests about um, compliance with the vaccination itself really should not lie within the housing programs that they need to be referred to their student health and um, other entities within um, the university that's responsible for that. Um, so that's an interesting, I was, I was surprised when ACHA and um, our rep on the committee is Claudia and she was like, no housing programs, that's not within the educational mission about the vaccines. Um, so I think one of the things that we are going to encourage folks is to make sure that they're making contact with the appropriate offices to answer those questions. I know that for the religious exemptions, um, our general counsel is very involved as well as our health system um, in creating those waivers. And the discussion is about a higher threshold of um, what is a significant belief and tying it to the religious organization. Um, our health system, we have had some experience with mandating flu vaccines for healthcare professionals um, and those folks who take a medical or religious exemption as a result of, of that. So we have some lessons learned from that, but, but as Frankie said, it is going to be um, a very uh, delicate balance at your institution um, because you have to, uh, according to HIPAA, you have the uh, private health information, the PHI that I've learned about. Um, and so that is why a lot of the information related to proof of COVID vaccinations or not, or incentives really um, and tracking needs to be outside of the housing programs. I do think we will play a role, a significant role in incentives um, as it relates to the residential experience. If you look at Rutgers, who is an early adopter of mandating vaccines, they basically say in their frequently asked questions that if you are not vaccinated and you do not provide proof, you are no, not allowed to live in on-campus housing. Um, so we are wrestling now with um, the question, and I'm not gonna answer it, and my subgroup's not gonna answer it with respect to roommates who are not vaccinated with roommates who are, are vaccinated. I do know that there's discussions and questions about limiting um, uh, attendance at large events like convocation, athletic events, um, family weekends, homecomings, and things like that. But um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. I, I also want to take an opportunity here to just remind folks that the the framework for our reentry work group is going to follow very much um, the same framework 
of the Future of Housing Task Force that was assembled a year ago expertly like by Chris Silva, who is on the, um, is on the round table today, I see. Um, and what we tried to produce in that document a year ago was information for you to consider and questions that you need to answer on your campus rather than guidance. So it's important that we understand that the, the purpose of the roundtable today and the final product that we hope to produce as a part of the work team is providing you with the information you need to go into the conversations with your campus. Because one thing that we've all agreed upon is the last year taught us that um, there are some best practice things that we can follow out there, but oftentimes local, state, and, and sometimes our campus guidance are going to make the final determination on what we can or cannot do. So I just want to make sure I prepared folks properly for some of the responses you're going to hear today that we're just going to, we're going to try and feed you with information for you to consider. Mike Schultz, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, and so great to see so many great friends uh, on this uh, on this meeting. Uh, even if I'm not an SHO anymore, um, uh, figure I'd bomb you guys a little bit. But Gay, I do have a question for you. Um, I think you were you were saying that in your, the end of your last comment that you are considering the vaccination information. Um, as a medical record um, and thus following under HIPAA. Are there institutions or is there the ability to collect vaccination information if they're vaccinated or not outside of health services where it does not become a HIPAA protected record? Do you know that answer? You're muted. I, I, I can, well, she's figuring that out. The guidance that we've gotten, I, I don't wanna know that it's definitive in any way, is that HIPAA applies to healthcare professionals, which we are not, uh, and that we can request the question of that. We can't compel the answer, but if it's voluntarily given, we can collect that information. And we would, and again, the whole issue of record keeping is a little bit grayer in the direction we've given. It just needs to be in a secure location and other things like we, we do. That's the guidance that we've gotten right now. So like we've asked all of our custodians, uh, have you been vaccinated? And they've all responded you know, with the one exception and he's getting vaccinated now. And we were clear that we could ask that question and we didn't get grieved in any way. Okay, so, but the, the fine line is once it goes into like at UVA VA, where they're collecting it as a medical record, then it would follow under HIPAA. And, and, and my guess too, and I would guess and check with your, your experts on this, but right, if you right. remember that file from say, uh, or some reason imported a data set from health records, it would, it would probably extend, but that's just my best guess in one year of law school. But Thank Mike, you. but Mike ACHA, did say in our meeting that that's, vaccinations are considered a private health information. So I think as your institution is determining how you are going to collect and store it, um, at least Virginia has said that it is, we do, every incoming student has to do a pre-health checklist and they have to provide vaccinations that are state statutory mandated the MMR, the polio. And so they have to upload that information as part of their incoming student status checklist. Um, and so this vaccine is going to be, the COVID is going to have a kind of a little separate link to it in addition to the pre-health because those are mandated by the state of Virginia. And this is not, this is an institutional decision. Uh, but I still think that most schools will fall under that that is health information. And I don't think our ACHA colleagues would advocate for housing programs to be collecting that information. I'll draw your attention to the chat where Denise had put up some information. I think she's spot on regarding when FERPA trumps HIPAA um, in regard to the processes that Gay was just talking about there. So 
these are important things for you to consider and talk about on your campuses internally before you start collecting these records and decide how broadly you're going to share the information for the purposes of determining who's eligible to do certain things, to work, to live in your housing programs. Um, make sure you get those worked out early on. We had a lot of questions also related to testing, um, which kind of- hey, Dan, before we transition away yep, from this topic, I just think it's worth noting, um, I, you know, I work on a campus, and I know there are lots of campuses on this call and associated with the association that have multi-year residency requirements. And they're not always popular requirements among our students. So setting up, a, setting up a situation where we're requiring a vaccination to live on campus or you can't live on campus has us violating our own residency requirements. And I, I know that that conversation may not be, we might not be at the, at the place our institutions where we're having that conversation, but I do think it's worth noting that when we start saying, well, then they can't live on campus. Um, housing folks are gonna think about that in a way that maybe our, our colleagues in other parts of the university aren't going to think about that. And we've spent at, at Miami a decade trying to make sure that our second year students are adhering to our second year residency requirement. And if all they have to do to get out of it is to not get a vaccination, that really throws our programmatic um, approach into, into an upheaval. Um, not only our programmatic approach, but our funding approach, how we build, how we house, all of those things. So as we're having conversations about the ramifications, and this is this is not actually student advocacy, but as we're having a conversation about the ramifications of what happens if you're not vaccinated and your ability to live on campus, I think we cannot lose sight of the fact that there are some real um, outcomes that could be irreversible um, related to the programmatic and the uh, physical management of the residence halls and apartments on our campuses. Dan, one thing I just want to point out, not for comment, just in, in, as, as folks hopefully read that ACHA guideline, uh, and, and I've only skimmed it, they do talk about for unvaccinated individuals, whether or not we need to set up specialized housing for them. So if members from your campus are also going to be reading that, realize that that's a thing that they pose as a question, not as a recommendation, but are you going to segment your unvaccinated students at, at some point? So just realize that's an issue that might uh, pop up on your campus because it does pop up in the, um, the guidelines. Yeah, if I could just quickly add, Vika, to your conversation or to your comment, we too have a first and second year residency requirement where I have heard mandated vaccines. Um, I don't know if Deb Schmidt Rogers is on the call or not, but if Loyola is choosing to mandate vaccines, they're not allowing them to take any in-person class and not allowing them to be on campus at all. So it's an all or nothing kind of thing. I presented that to our group. That's a huge financial piece for us. And then the other complication is we also run about 1,200 uh, university apartment beds, and those are leases. Those are legally binding. And so that's a big implication if we're saying you can't be a student on campus. So we're, we're wrestling with that as well. Thank you, Mary, for adding that. Good to see you. In the time that we have remaining, I wonder if we wanted to wrap up the conversation on vaccination and move into talking about testing and isolation and quarantine planning. So Gay, did you have any um, capstone comments about the vaccination conversation? No, I do think that all the points have been, um, are very good points. And the only other thing is, is maybe some institutions um, that Holly sent to us uh, yesterday was, um, the idea of maybe not allowing them on campus, but also restricting guest policies. Um, so that might be another area for, for folks because um, that discussion is out there as well. And that's all, I yield. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we, do have a, we do have a subgroup within our larger um, work group that is looking at the testing um, complexity involved with reentry um, Michelle Soldano was unable to join us today, but we did want to at least open this up for conversation about what folks are thinking about related to gateway testing your residents, um, whether you're going to continue to do surveillance testing or pool testing as the semester plays out, um, and then how does that fit into wherever your campus is going to land regarding the vaccination questions. Um, so there, were, if you we keep referencing the ACHA guidelines or the, the recommendations that came out earlier, um, there, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation and, and information in that document that I think is also 
items that Michelle's group has been talking about. Um, in particular, the issue regarding resources and then the exemption question um, regarding folks who may have gotten an exemption from vaccination, but then they may also be seeking an exemption from going through whatever kind of testing requirements you want to have on your campus. So I'll stop for a second, see if any of the folks who have some specific questions that they want answered today from the subgroup um, leaders that are here on the call. I'd also like to know who's paying for it on your campus because um, does that matter? This past year, the university picked up the tab of all student testing, but there's discussion now about testing and isolation and quarantine having a cost um, that the students or the employee staff may have to bear. For, for my campus, the, the plan right now is that we're going to require all residential and face-to-face -face, um, course students to go through surveillance testing unless they provide us with um, proof of vaccination. Um, and currently the plan is for our campus to absorb the costs of that saliva-based testing program. So we're gonna continue on the model that we were using during this past academic year, but um, and similar to your comment earlier about using guest privileges as an incentive for vaccination, getting out of the testing pool is one of the carrots we're putting on the end of the stick to try and drive people towards vaccinating or at least getting considering vaccination by the time they arrive here in the fall. Others have a different model out there you'd like to share. Dan, how, how often are you going to be testing uh, surveillance testing? for the non-vaccinated people? Our, our plan right now is to do that weekly. So we're, we're expanding our testing locations. We had one large testing center in our ballroom during the academic year, and we're now expanding to put one out in, uh, in an empty lobby of one of my partially closed residential facilities. And then there'll be one in a, an adjacent smaller ballroom in the student center, try to absorb what we, we anticipate will be um, fairly large groups in the beginning of the year. Now, separate to that, our athletics um, participants do their own testing through the NCAA guidelines at their facilities. So that's a fairly significant chunk of our population that are both physically on campus and also going to face-to-face -face classes that are being tested outside of the, the general population. We also are requiring, uh, unless this changes, we are requiring any departments that have staff that work with the residential populations on a day-to-day -day basis to go through surveillance testing or be exempted through providing their own vaccination records. So that would include everybody in the housing residential services area, the dining program, our building service workers, anybody, you know, residential technology, anybody who would have a reason to have to be working in a residential facility would be um, required to go through surveillance testing unless they went through the exemption process on our campus. Can I just add, I'm going to channel Alan Blattner at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he has indicated that um, North Carolina and the North Carolina system is going to be a non-mandate vaccination. So what they are doing at Chapel Hill is there will be a three-part question about, are you vaccinated? And they will say yes, no, or other, or or don't want to answer. And everyone who does not mark yes will automatically be dumped into a database for weekly prevalence testing. So they're not going to rely on, um, you know, signing up or having their housing program or anything like that. So I thought that was an interesting um, approach uh, for a school that had already determined that they would not be requiring vaccinations. Thanks for sharing. The, the issue regarding gateway testing for students returning to our residential communities for the fall is one that I know the subgroup is looking at. Uh, a number of us last year required gateway testing by our students prior to their arrival on campus to, sh to provide us with information that showed that they were in fact um, that they, that they were a negative PCR test before we allowed them to move into the residence halls. 
Others are pivoting and changing this year and not putting that burden back on the families prior to arriving, but are going to do gateway testing upon arrival to campus. So some campuses I think are exploring doing this in a parking lot where you would go through and, and do your testing and then trans, you know, transfer your vehicle and your belongings to your residence hall to move in. Um, others are doing this and then may have some mild form of quarantine or creating bubble type of situations with first year experience so that they can bring people in um, in pods and do testing and try to get results back within 24 hours. Is anybody thinking about doing anything different from what I'm describing as part of a gateway testing program for non-vaccinated students they'd like to share? And feel free to use the chat if you don't wanna to speak to the group. As you're mulling that over, I, I also throw out here that there were a number of questions about isolation and quarantine planning. And those of us that have been involved in this work um, for the last month or so, and those of us who had an opportunity to go through the ACHA um, recommendations the other day, unfortunately, no one's providing a, a kind of matrix telling you what percentage you should plan for regarding isolation and quarantine planning. This fall, there was a lot of different numbers and metrics to use a year ago um, based on your population sizes. But this year, um, there are no hard numbers that I think are going to provide anybody with a, with a best practice plan for establishing isolation or quarantine usage. Um, but it, it, it would appear that that is something that we are going to put out there as part of our, rec, our, um, our final document that you have to ask the question is, what if you have to provide for this. Have you thought about where that's going to be? Is it going to be an on-campus, off-campus situation? Is it going to be provided free of charge again and be a part of your residential program? Or are you going to have nominal fees attached to this? Um, and again, does that become a component of the vaccination requirement or not a requirement? Um, there is also, um, there's some strong language in the ACHA document regarding campuses not permitting their students who do test positive and or have been exposed to a positive case that they do not leave the campus and return home for their isolation or quarantine period. And so I think those are considerations your campus needs to think about as well. My campus is situated within 25, 30 minutes of most of the suburbs in the Chicago area. And we probably saw 60% of our students make the choice to go home for their isolation or quarantine period during the fall semester. Um, and that, that wasn't really what the, what the best practice recommendation was from our health professionals. But we also did not take the position as a campus that we were going to block that. Um, so thing, things for you all to consider based upon some of the conversations that are going on and in this area. And I'll stop for a second because I know Stephen's team is looking at operations and procedures and processes. Um, they weren't necessary. We have another group that's looking at occupancy management. But Stephen, you might want to add to this part of the conversation in case your subgroup has been looking into some of these questions. Yeah, so as far as quarantine and isolation housing goes, um, that magic percentage really hasn't landed anywhere. I know at my institution, what we did is determine um, what at our highest point, what percentage of the population did we have to quarantine and isolate? Um, that was unvaccinated at the time and it was 7%. Um, now that was very institutionally centric. It's not really like a national study, but that's what the we used as a metric to kind of determine what are we gonna do for the fall, but we feel that we will in the fall need to um, uh, look at those things. Um, as far as testing when opening, um, right now it sounds like uh, there will be, um, there's kind of, it's kind of all over the place right now, but there is seems like a strong uh, belief that we're gonna test while those students at least that are not vaccinated. Um, I know at my institution, we're not going to be uh, testing uh, vaccinated students at all. I know that's a conversation in the chat too, but um, as far as what happens at opening, um, it'll be just, uh, it seems like those that are not um, vaccinated are going to be uh, tested uh, and then have to go through some sort of testing 
sequential testing program, whatever that might be on campuses, whether that's once a week, twice a week, or uh, whatever on campuses. Thank you, Stephen. Frank, sure. do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, this goes back to the isolation and um, quarantine space. I know that that tracker last year was very helpful as we were trying to figure that out. Uh, but I participated in conversation with a lot of the Neo Kuho directors recently, and we just kind of we, we did a straw poll on this very topic. Uh, what I can tell you is that the number that kept coming up the most is somewhere approximating about two percent of their population. Um, there are some that are going much lower than that. I don't know if our colleagues from RIT are here, but uh, they're going back to again inc increasing triples and having less than one percent uh, of the, their percentage there. So I think it's really institutionally driven uh, with what's going on at this point. I think they're all from the, the straw poll we took. It was going to be much lower than what you had in the fall uh, this past year, but counting on the fact there's going to be some sort of higher percentage of vaccination voluntarily or a requirement. Uh, so, and again, we were very cautious last year. We did 10% and we're glad we did 10% of our capacity uh, for isolation quarantine. As of right now, we're not planning on any, but that's before the isolate, the ACHA guidelines came out, which said we recommend not sending them home because that was kind of our plan for the, um, the unvaccinated. So, film at 11. Um, if I could just make a comment as well. At Case Western Reserve, we're planning on um, testing. We've been doing weekly testing uh, for about a year now. And so we're moving toward for the fall, we're going to uh, entry level testing only and then symptomatic testing should it occur in groups or people coming back to campus and stuff. We have a large group of faculty and staff who have not been on campus for over a year. And so those will be tested when they come back to campus at the beginning of August, as well as all new students who have not been here all along. So we'll be testing those as they come in, whether they've been vaccinated or not. So they'll be doing that. I've been trying to do a uh, survey of similar schools to us for the last month trying to get this isolation quarantine numbers. And you're right, schools are all over the place. What I have found is two to 3% is probably the most accurate numbers that I've seen. Some have taken old buildings that are offline or using those. Some have the luxury of having a hotel on campus and are using those, but for the most part, two to 3%. Um, some are having isolation spaces, no quarantine spaces, depending upon whether they are mandating a vaccination uh, policy or not, and then just providing isolation spaces. For us, we're about 3% is what we're doing um, with isolation and quarantine. Our health officials are probably pushing us to hold more space than what we think we need. Um, and so be it. So we're, we're probably being a little bit more conservative for them. And so we're holding more on that side and stuff. And so uh, that's kind of what we're doing as well. One of the other things that I've seen from doing a survey of different schools, what I've noticed is a lot of schools are getting away from quads, triples and stuff and are going down to just doubles. So I've noticed that a lot of schools are changing their occupancies and eliminating these larger uh, occupant rooms and just reducing those down as well, which, which has happened across many schools and stuff. We've done that ourselves, uh, reduce the occupancy of our larger number of rooms and stuff. So I just threw that out as well. Thank you, John. Appreciate you sharing. No problem. I have a question. Another topic that has come up, regardless of your institution, is how many institutions are going to um, 
step up a program that if a student comes unvaccinated but changes their mind, they will be able to get vaccinated in the community or at your institution. Straw poll. And, and Gay, at our institution, our plan currently is, and again, subject to change, is while we don't, we'll be screening testing, uh, we'll be looking for anyone who is not in compliance with, has uploaded a vaccination record or requested an exemption. And if they don't request an exemption at that point, we're gonna just pull them out of line and they'll go get stuck, uh, is at least what my health center director is planning on right now. So kind of full service um, out in your car almost. Looks like the thumbs had it, Gay, that folks are at least trying, at least optimistically planning there'll be some, some type of vaccination either run by your county or other health professionals near your campuses for fall. And that, that's, another one of the, that's another one of the things that we've done as a country to combat the pandemic is it seems that that keeps changing every 30 to 45 days. So what we're talking about today could be vastly different by August, we could be getting there could be shots available on every corner by the time we get to August. There were a number of questions um, prior to us gathering today regarding issues in the policy area. So I'm gonna turn some of this over to Frankie and Stephen here in a moment, but you had, um, you, you had collectively some questions about what are we going to do with non-residential students in terms of permitting them to be guests in the residence halls um, and navigating, you know, again, everything has the umbrella of the vaccination question over it. Um, also, um, many of our campuses de-densified public spaces and, and tried to really discourage folks from using what we typically try to design into our communities as places for folks to gather. What's your plan for using that in the fall? What are you thinking in terms of masking requirements, social distancing? And if there's any other compliance strategies that you're planning on using for your students and or with your staff. So, so I'm going to pause for a second. That's a big wheelbarrow full of items and let Frankie talk a little bit about where his subgroup is on the compliance questions. Uh, thanks, Dan. Yeah, and, and really part of the challenge we're doing is we're trying to figure out what policies are we going to be in compliance with and recognizing those are going to vary widely from institution to institution and particularly for those that have a vaccine requirement and those that don't have a vaccine requirement. So what we're, we're trying to figure out are some of the more broader issues rather than saying how you should do it or how you should deal with this is how you might begin to, to chunk some of those, those areas. Um, some of the questions that have popped up in this is what uh, kind of conversations in terms of these compliance with the policies should be done through uh, the student conduct system? You know, should we enforce the policies? What are the consequences for doing that in an educational process? Or are these situations in which yeah, they are more housing agreement situations? You can't live here if you're not vaccinated, if you don't comply with policies, we'll take an administrative action for doing that. We even graded the honor code uh, for this. So I think there's these issues. And then, you know, how do you begin to deal with those who are vaccinated, who are, who are, who are not vaccinated and create this kind of, avoid the social ostracization? Uh, I, I did suggest, you know, I mentioned to Dan that you know, my suggestion of how do we know who's vaccinated or not, we just get a big tattoo of V on their forehead. Uh, that's being uh, that's under consideration at my institution right now. So, um, no, not really. Um, but I think those are the issues of how do we engage the students in this process? And I think there's a lot of interest in how do we engage them to own this as part of this. This is what it means to be a whatever your random mascot is. Uh, you know, this is what it means to be a roadie ram. We take care of each other. We do these things because it's what it means to be a part of community, which I think a lot of the, the reentry programs are going to be looking at and looking for to proceed in that group in terms of this is what it means to be a part of the community. So how do we enforce those issues? So we're kind of wrestling with a lot of stuff. I think one of the things where most of us seem to be leaning is going back to as much normal as we can. And I was encouraged to see the ACHA guidelines say that we can use public spaces in that way. Uh, so our plans are to, again, start allowing inter-hall visitation. Uh, the, only, the only restrictions that we're going to place on visitation is size of people in normal groups based on fire code. And the mask mandate, ours is going to require if you're unvaccinated, you have to wear a mask indoors and outdoors at all times and maintain three feet distance. Uh, but other than that, we're going to have free association uh, for, for, for doing that. Uh, but that may not always be the case at, at our institutions. Uh, so they relax the mask mandate completely um, for uh, if you're vaccinated. Uh, but again, so part of us is trying to figure out where we're going with the, these issues. And from a policy perspective, it's like visitation, 
uh, is going to be a, a big one, enforcement of whatever the policies are that are going, are going to be out there. And then there was some concern in, in another group of, they, they're just so hungry for the social interaction. Are we going to see large group gathering sizes that may or may not violate community health standards, but create kind of other kind of uh, health and behavior standards for the community? So it, it's all across the board right now. Uh, but we're, again, what we're interested in is, are there topical areas, which questions you're asking yourself that, hey, I don't, I don't know the answer to, but just at least make sure that it's on our radar so that we can either, if not provide answers, uh, we can provide some resources where you might find some answers. Thanks, Frankie. I'm, I'm gonna call on Vika at this point to talk a little bit about how to examine some of these things through the lens of advocating for our students. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just want you all to know that I like hate wearing a mask and I hate the fact that our residence halls were empty and I hate not using doubles and I, I hate all that stuff. And so everybody um, being vaccinated or, or being able to determine or distinguish who's vaccinated and who's not uh, makes a lot of like makes a lot of sense, but I do think that we have to be careful in thinking about what kind of alternate experience are we creating for our students who um, don't want to be vaccinated, which is a different group than our students, faculty, and staff who cannot be vaccinated. So I cannot be vaccinated if I have an um, autoimmune disorder, if, if I have a variety of other health conditions. I cannot be vaccinated. And so if we are incentivizing vaccinations and disincentivizing not being vaccinated, we really are putting people for life in a situation where they're going to have a disparate and different experience than their colleagues who just were born with the ability to be vaccinated. So as we have those conversations on our campuses, we have to think about, we have to think about that. Um, a student who has been vaccinated and never has to do any testing um, and a student who cannot be vaccinated has to be tested every week, that's not a sustainable way to run our campuses. So we really do have to think about what that really means, not in the short term, but in the long term. Um, for for all, all of our vaccinations, really, but particularly thinking about um, as we come into COVID, Incentiv incentivizing things makes a lot. We're like, oh, great, we'll give you in Ohio. They're giving away a million dollars. If you, it's like that's great. Um, but also, if there is somebody that cannot be vaccinated, they are they are uh, relegated to a different lived experience, a different um, opportunity, and and that might work for the state of Ohio, but that does not work for our campuses. Um, that does not work to uphold the, um, for the public good of the experience that we are trying to pro provide for, for our campuses and for our greater society. So just some things to think about as we're thinking about incentivizing, of, oh, you can have a visitor, you can't have a visitor, um, you can leave campus, you can't leave campus, those kinds of things. There was a little bit of conversation about, um, oh, the, the AC ACHA guidance around, can students leave to go home and recover? Um, I don't think we have any business, I don't, Victor Bell Robinson, not Miami University, not a Kuhawai, I don't think we have any business telling somebody where they can recover when they are sick. I think that is an overreach of our civil liberties. And so I, that, those are the kinds of things that my subgroup is, is having conversations about. Like, oh yeah, that makes sense. They should stay here. It's really, it, it's really good for them. That's kidnapping. If you don't let people leave when they want to go someplace, that you can't you can't do that. And so creating policies, A, that aren't really great policy, and B, that create a um, an adversarial relationship with our students, I think does not serve our ends academically or educationally in the long run. Appreciate you breaking out of your shell today, Vicka. And, awesome. and Vicky, I agree with you. I think we do allow students to go home and recover at home if they want to. Um, they just can't do public transportation. That's the only thing that we tell them that they cannot do, but we allow them to go and be isolated at home. We give them some guidelines and stuff as they travel and stuff, but we do allow them to do that, so. Thank you. And I would just say to, to Vika, one of the things that we're looking for is especially for those students who are unable to get vaccinated for medical reasons, I believe we're leaning towards they fall under ADA requirements. Um, so our Student Disability Access Center would then you determine and ensure that that um, all of their rights in their student experiences is in line despite their disability. Okay, you know, that's a great segue into talking about the student experience of what do we think we want to have happening as our students come back in regarding all these 
compliance issues and these mandates or non-mandates. So I'll give Christina a platform here to talk a little bit about her subgroup and what they're trying to focus on in terms of engagement as students return. And I think it dovetails nicely with all the conversations that were just happening. What we're really looking at first is actually how we can engage with students over the summer to really help them understand what they're coming into in the fall. And it really matches exactly right with what Frankie was talking about with um, some of the different compliance issues. Um, I worry that um, our student staff and our, our administrations are gonna be a little bit nervous around compliance this year, because what we've lived in for a year and a half is a place where everything changes every 10 minutes. Um, and so we have a, a policy and CDC guidance comes out and it takes us 10 days to figure it out. And then we put out a policy and then 10 days later, more CDC guidance comes out. Um, and, and one of the things that as we've talked as a committee um, and as I've talked to other colleagues, um, one of the things that has come out of the pandemic that we've really found that has been really good is that the students are engaging with us, um, especially over the summer. Last summer, we did so much engagement with our students to help them understand where, where we were thinking, where we were at, um, using a lot of Zoom. Um, you know, now that we're comfortable with Zoom, we can actually gather with our students over the summer, which wasn't something we could do in previous years. Um, and so taking that opportunity to engage with them early to, to talk about some of that compliance stuff and say, here's the spirit of what's happening. And, you know, when the CDC guidance changes, it takes us 10 days because it has to go through this and we have to think of this and then we have to have folks, you know, understand and write policies on it. Um, and so really engaging in some of that work nice and early so that people understand why we have the policies we do and what they can expect coming in. Um, some of the pieces of engagement that we're talking about over the summer are even talking to the students to see what they're thinking about for the fall. Um, you know, I, I think we have some thoughts around that, um, not only about the pandemic and understanding the, the policies that are happening, but um, we've had um, tremendous social unrest in the last year um, and our, our society is going through something pretty big right now. Are our students bringing that back with them in the fall? Um, for our students that were here with us last year who were on campus for those that were open, um, what what was their experience? What, what was it like? With, were there things they liked? You know, did they like taking their food outside to be able to sit at the picnic tables? Um, you know, did they like weekly emails and check-ins from us? Um, and what are they looking forward to getting back to? So using the summer to engage with them, doing a summer toolkit series to say, here's what's happening. Here's what we're anticipating might be some places where we're all gonna trip up a little bit and how we can get ahead of that. Here's some things you can expect from us. What questions do you have? What are you bringing to our campus with you in the fall? What are you excited about? You know, do you want a toolkit series on how to manage your time now that you can't roll over at 7.59 and start attending class? Um, or do you just wanna hang with your friends? Um, you know, as Frankie said, one of the things that we know was most impactful was the students' ability to visit with each other between buildings. Um, and so um, really tapping into our students to be able to understand what, what they're coming to our campus with. Is it more logistical? Is it big picture? Cause they haven't had the chance to process this with their community. Um, and are they really looking for more educational and more social opportunities? Um, my gut tells me it's a little bit of both, um, but we're looking forward to talking with them um, to really hear what they're looking for. Thank you so much. We've, uh, we only have a few minutes left and I'm not sure we're gonna be able to have an engaged conversation on this, but I just wanna acknowledge that we did hear from you as participants that you have a lot of questions about how to care for staff. You're concerned about their morale you're concerned about the wellness, you're concerned about staff who have been on their feet for 14 straight months, managing your campus programs and have to find a way to re-energize themselves and start all over again in 60 days. And so um, we do have a subgroup led by uh, Kendra Skinner from Southeast Missouri, who is focusing in on some of these issues. And I think they're gonna have some really excellent ideas and some, some thoughts for you to consider as you begin planning your training programs and start preparing for another academic year as we march towards the new normal. Um, but there's also some questions about what are what did we learn from the past year and how are we taking these strategies forward to better serve our students, better serve our staff, and what are some of the, the ideas about how we leverage technology to do what we needed to do when we had to be distanced and what are we gonna take forward to try and use that as better tools in the work that we do in serving our residential communities. So these are also themes that we're gonna to try to tackle over the next couple of weeks and make a part of the final product. So I'll stop for a minute, see if anybody has some um, questions or comments or have something they wanna offer the participants here before we wrap this up. This is open to everyone. Dan, Jeff Novak here, good to see you again. <laughs> from last yeah. week. Uh, 
One thing I'd be curious about is how do we support each other that we all have different uh, health service professionals, eh and professionals that view it all completely different. So when I hear people saying, well, we're not doing triples or quads, we're doing triples and quads uh, in space that we have it. We've talked with our health professionals and they feel that we've got to move away from this fear of COVID to living with COVID and that in the future, you'll never ask your colleague next to you, have you had the, you, I mean, you haven't previously asked your colleague, have you had your flu shot, right? Um, and that if you do your part in getting vaccinated, knowing that again, there are some that can't, um, that uh, we've got to move away from that fear in essence, you know, and, and living with it. And how do we support each other that, you know, uh, no one is right or wrong out there. <laughs> We're all still you know, figuring it out. Um, and uh, just because we're having triples doesn't mean we're going to have a, an issue of COVID because one institution has not chosen to do it. And I think we saw that throughout this year. Uh, institutions that tested didn't test and um, and still were successful without testing programs. And uh, so I, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I know you know that, and that's what's been expressed here. But how do we continually support each other? I guess with guidance we're each getting on our own campuses. You know? Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, and I also want to tell you all I appreciate you participating today and giving up an hour of your day. Hopefully, you got something that you could take away. It's going to help build your plans for your campus. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Holly at this point, so we can wrap this one up. Great. Thanks, Dan. And thank you to our panelists today and all of you for being here. Um, as you know, we do these roundtables very, very frequently. We'll continue to do SHO roundtables with this group moving forward. Um, this session is being recorded and will appear on our YouTube channel probably in the next 48 hours. So if you have a colleague that missed it, feel free to share that. Um, and if you have any questions, please let this work group know. Thank you all again for being here. Have a great day.